The purpose of this video is to discuss two concepts. We'll be talking about adaptations and fitness. Uh, in order to talk about these two things, we really have to discuss adaptations first. Uh, the definition for an adaptation is some kind of trait that's shaped by natural selection that increases an organism's reproductive success. Something to remember that we've been talking about all chapter is that fitness in the Darwinian sense has to do with the organism's ability to reproduce and pass on its genes. So it doesn't matter if you have an organism that's perfectly adapted to its environment, if it doesn't survive long enough to pass on its traits to the next generation, that individual doesn't really contribute towards the species. So as you can probably imagine, our definition for fitness is going to take that idea into account. It's just the measure of an organism's reproductive success. So the more offspring an organism f um, puts forth into the environment, that increases its fitness overall. So what we'll take a second to look at as we work our way through these videos are some examples from your textbook of things that will increase an organism's fitness through adaptations. One thing I want you to keep in mind, just like all of the examples we've been talking about this chapter, this is not an exhaustive list. There are many, many different kinds of adaptations most of which go well beyond the scope of the things that are covered in this video. But these are just some common ones to give you an idea of how some species are adapting to their environment in such a way that increases their fitness, their ability to survive and then reproduce and pass on their genes. The first type of adaptation we'll talk about is camouflage. Uh, you can think of a lot of species in nature that use this to their advantage. The example that we're looking at in this video is a sea dragon. Now you can see how the uh, the sea dragon blends in well with its environment. Its outer appendages kind of give it the appearance of seaweed, allowing it to blend in with the area around it. This is going to decrease the amount of predation that this individual species experiences. If it's less likely to be eaten by a predator, it's more likely then to survive long enough to pass on its genes to the next generation. Something to think about is traits like this wouldn't come about all at once. Uh, probably adapted to this slowly over time by having maybe a genetic mutation that would pick up some traits that would allow it to blend in a little bit and it got more and more exaggerated as time goes on. So you have to remember the mechanisms we were talking about for evolution. Those are the things that are going to play into you know, how these different adaptations take place. The next one for us to talk about is mimicry. Uh, there are quite a few examples of this in nature. We'll just go over a couple of uh, simple ones. The idea with mimicry, though, is that one species is going to evolve to resemble another. Uh, typically, there's some kind of dangerous species that's then mimicked by a harmless species. So the king snake and the western coral snake are good examples of this. Um, you would think maybe that the king snake looks a little bit more threatening because that one's uh, a little bit bigger, but actually the California king snake is not poisonous, whereas the western coral snake is highly poisonous. So you can see how these two species represent, or I'm sorry, uh, resemble each other, and um, that's because the California king snake then gets the benefits of the western coral snake being poisonous. So a lot of species can't differentiate between the two, so they'll leave both of them alone just because they assume they are the same species. Uh, but if you're looking at this carefully, hopefully you notice a few differences in their coloration. You can see that the white bands are definitely thicker on the western coral snake, as are the black bands. Whereas here, the most dominant band is the orange one, and uh, the black and white are far you know, less dense when it comes to filling out their body. So there's definitely some differences, but they're close enough where most things in nature will mistake them. Uh, another example of things that we actually have around here are two kinds of butterflies. We've got the monarch butterfly and the viceroy butterfly. The monarch butterflies, which we see really commonly around here in the fall, um, they are a particular species that's actually poisonous to most birds. The viceroy butterfly mimics them and actually does quite a good job you have to look at this very, very carefully in order to pick out the differences in their wing structures. You can see, though, that this part of the wing is definitely different than what we're seeing in the monarch. But the mimicry here is very, very close, which is something that will happen over time 
because the viceroy then picks up the benefits of the monarch. It's not a poisonous species, but it gets left alone because most things can't differentiate between the two. I mean, they look extremely similar, far more so than the king snake and the western coral snake. Uh, the last one for us to talk about is antimicrobial resistance. Uh, we're seeing this with bacteria that's becoming resistant to penicillin and other antibiotics. Uh, one of the more famous ones right now is referred to as MRSA. So that's methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Um, that's basically a type of bacteria that is resilient to methicillin. Uh, methicillin is an even stronger version of penicillin in that it's an antibiotic that will kill most uh, bacterial infections. The problem with MRSA is that if somebody gets it, uh, they cannot be treated with an antibiotic. So that can be a very serious infection. If your body can't fight it off on its own, um, people occasionally end up dying from MRSA or they will get um, like parts of their body you know, amputated because of MRSA if it's in an area or something like that is a possibility. So this is something that's extremely serious because over time, um, bacteria are basically building a resistance to the antibiotics that we're using. Most bacteria at this point that infect people and make us sick are resistant to at least one type of antibiotic. Uh, the reason this happens is people get antibiotics when they're sick. Like let's say, for example, you have strep throat. That's a bacterial infection. You go to the doctor, they give you an antibiotic. You're supposed to take it usually for 7 to 10 days. Well, typically, after day 2 or 3, the antibiotic's working pretty well, and most of your symptoms are probably pretty much gone, like you're feeling a lot better. And then what happens is people forget to take the rest of the medicine because their symptoms go away. The issue with that is you're not killing off all of those bacteria that are making you sick. The ones that are left are actually the stronger ones that are naturally a little bit more resistant to the antibiotic. So if we do that enough over time, eventually the antibiotics will stop working pretty much altogether. And then we'll be back in the position we were before antibiotics where you couldn't really treat people who had bacterial infections. So I know it sounds like are making a big deal out of something small, but it really it is a big deal. You know, when you get an antibiotic, it's very important that you take the whole thing and uh, you know you take it according to the directions on the the bottle there. But uh, it is an easy thing to forget, and it's definitely something that can create problems later on if those bacteria become resistant. Um, the last thing for us to talk about is this idea that some people get stuck in that all traits are, uh, are due to some kind of adaptation. And it's easy to get tunnel vision like this. Uh, if you remember when we were going over Mendelian genetics, we were doing Punnett squares, you know, I asked that question about the zebra and how zebras have their stripes and if it's a trait that's co-dominant or incomplete dominant. And a lot of people got that one wrong on the test because we got so into that mindset of thinking that everything that's striped or spotted in nature is either going to be co-dominant or incompletely dominant, or one of those, you know, Mendelian exceptions. And um, what we're seeing here is that not all traits are due to adaptations. A simple one where scientists are incorrect has to do with human babies. Uh, babies are born, and they are one of the most um, helpless creatures in, in all of nature. You know, you think of animals in the wild that are born and can pretty much take care of themselves pretty quickly. Um, human babies are very much of an exception to that. Human babies are completely helpless for long periods of time, right? For well over a year, that baby is pretty much helpless and relies entirely on its parents. Um, one of the reasons babies are so helpless has to do with their morphology. If you take a look at the picture of the baby, the reason I included it in here is not just because this baby's real cute, but it's to show you the relative size of the head in relation to the rest of the body. Uh, part of the reason babies look so adorable is they're kind of proportionately strange compared to adults. You know, if you saw an adult whose head was this size in relation to the rest of its body, uh, that person would look ridiculous. Uh, but babies have such big heads because humans have complex brains compared to other species in nature. And babies are born at a relatively early stage of development. That's why they're so helpless. Uh, partly because humans walk upright. Since we walk upright, our pelvis has a certain shape. And remember, the baby has to pass through the pelvis when it's being born. So because of that, the baby's head can only develop to a certain extent. Otherwise, it would be too big to, uh, to actually fit through the birth canal 
and then be born in a way that wasn't completely, you know, like an invasive to the mother. So part of the, the reason scientists used to think this happened, they used to think babies were born at an early stage of development, so they would get a lot of parental care and nurturing, and that would make them more intelligent. Uh, it turns out that's not the reason we have this adaptation. The reason babies are born earlier in development is because our brains are complicated, and so the baby has to have a relatively big head, but its head can't get so big that it won't actually fit through the, uh, the pelvic bone, and basically the, the baby would grow to a point where it wouldn't be able to be born. It wouldn't be able to fit you know, out of the birth canal and, uh, and out of the mother. So a lot of times we'll try to fit something into an explanation for an adaptation when it doesn't actually work. So keep that in mind. Uh, this works for a lot of traits in nature, but it doesn't explain everything. Not everything is necessarily adaptive. Uh, some traits come about just out of necessity, sort of uh, like the idea why babies are born so helpless overall. So that's uh, the last one for this video. Uh, make sure you take some time to answer the questions at the end, and I'll see you in class.